Okay, we're here at the Montague Museum. It's a fall day, the sun's out, and I'm standing here. Uh, Jack Lipka is here. Uh, Jack's parents were one of the original founders of the Montague Museum. And uh, on the other side over here is Jim Haley. And Jim is sort of a Mr. Overseer of the Montague Museum. Well, it started out around our dining room table at home with the founders got together and mother made a lunch and they sat down and said we got to preserve the old things before they're all gone. The Montague Museum m membership actually purchased this museum with, with their historical funds. Because actually what we're in is the old, uh, the Montague Methodist Church. And as it says here that uh, there was an earlier church which was burned. They then met at the Presbyterian Church, the Fair Memorial Church, now known as. And then basically in 1872, they built this, uh, the yellow brick building here. And um, I mean, we all went to Sunday school here, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Got our Mrs. Dahl and Helen Anderson and the whole number, right. Okay, Jim. You uh, are now kind of overseeing a lot of improvements and things like that, and uh, the continuation. I often feel that maybe you're kind of taking the role of the new Henry Rossler kind of thing. Well, I like to think I'm the curator. Uh, I do keep, I'm the financial secretary on the board uh, officially, but I, I like to think more so I'm the curator. I think the other thing to go back to is like what Jack was saying is that, okay, so they sit around the table over there uh, at, at the Lipka house and that there was a time, this was like during the 1970s, and obviously that generation could see that there was lots of things disappearing. You know, somebody's barn was being torn down or somebody's whatever was happening. And so there's farm implements, there's, there's you know, canning things, the, the, the whole aspect of like previous generations and how they survived. And that um, that could either going to end up in a dumpster or an antique store or in some kind of a collection. And that's that's where it all kind of evolved into. The people of the area made it go because they were willing to give you know some mm -hmm. pretty nice things mm -hmm. and to have it someplace where everybody could enjoy it yeah and then later on we we get darwin bennett who uh is very much into history and uh he he owned the local paper and also was kind of helped promoting that and then also helped found like the whitehall excuse me the white lake historical society uh interesting spin Okay, we're at the Bonnie Museum and uh, you can begin to see some things which we're collecting or have been collected. And that um, up here basically is kind of the founder's wall and supporters of the Montague Museum. And, uh, you know, Jack's parents are here in the, in the upper picture. Uh, Wendell and Opal, uh, Marvin Mamie Lipke, Henry and Velma Rossler, uh, the Wolf family, and uh, other pictures of the people here. The life members are all mentioned up on top. The museum founders, life members underneath that. And... Uh, and the story begins basically here. You kind of walk in and you think like, oh my gosh, what's that thing over there? You know, I don't know what that is. Or what did they do with that? Um, or there's a plaque from the trunk, something line bridge. Where was that? And then the questions begin. And uh, I see over there, there's a picture of Jerry Ford. Uh, you know, President Jerry Ford. Curious, yeah. The complete uniform of the Spanish-American War which very few museums have. And this is the Michigan volunteer of that war. Obviously, um, medals from, I mean, here's, here's the Purple Heart. It's always nice if you label something on the back, but somehow they didn't. <laughs> Discharge papers for an Eilers. He was a seaman. Charles, Charles yeah. Andrew Eilers. Yeah. A lot of old medals here too. These, these are um, reunions. I like this one's called N.H. Noah H. Ferry, post number three, Whitehall. Um, Noah Ferry um, died at the Battle of, excuse me, Battle of Gettysburg. There we are with Noah Ferry again. Here we have a 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun. Don't rough around here. Do you uh, remember when that was in the back of the study hall in Montague High School? Up in the bookcase or something? Yeah, up in the back. <laughs> of, I don't know why or what, uh, but that was in the school study hall. Okay, the old early school, yeah. K through 12. 
And then, you know, one thing blurs into another. Here we have uh, a lot of the lumbering equipment there, the hooks for rolling logs and um, also picking up logs or picking up ice. Well, both. Yeah. I mean, logs more. This top one here is what's called the camp up. It's a PV. Those were used more in the river drives and stuff, and that was a wood one. Then the long ones, the pipe poles, were used in the river, down at the booming grounds. And all the people, uh, they piped their logs up into the sawmills out of their ponds with those two. Okay, lumbering era, a uh, big important era uh, in, in Montague, Whitehall Lake, uh, White Lake history. Uh, this is done by Bob Wesley. He did it for the uh, Centennial, Centennial, 1867. Shows all the different mills around White Lake. And um, Bob, very clever guy. And um, anyway, um, also, Jack can point out the different logs. Branding, go ahead. The different log marks were done with the, with the marker in the woods so that they sorted them in the river at the booming grounds. But this was actually the first zip code of the area. Okay. Each mill had their own several different markers. A lot of interesting brands. This was for the guy that gauged the logs. He could strengthen or get this with the slides. For the different... Oh, how many board feet, that kind how of thing? Much, how long he wanted them to cut their pieces. Okay. Dan Yakes did this wonderful book called Logging the White, uh, which tells the whole story of uh, the White Lake chapter and logging. This is ox teams of horses and oxen that were used to drag the logs out of the woods. Here's all the log marks from the area around the, around the White Lake area. John C. Lewis is the Lewis House next to the Playhouse Theater. Dalton Brothers, Dalton's become the Masons. Yeah. Dalton's was the first, or one of the first water mills in the area. There was five water mills in the area. One at Duck Lake, the Mears Mill and Lion's Den. Right. The Dalton's were up on Silver Creek, where Eiler's place was. There was the uh, Carlton Mill up on Carlton Creek and Skeels, mm -hmm. and then Brown's Mill on Fruitvale Pond. Yeah, Rochdale, Brown's right. Pond. Yeah. Brown. Okay, the story here is that John Lex Chisholm, uh, son of Nellie B. Chisholm, uh, actually they were cousins of my mother, uh, Lex, uh, and anyway, he re worked for the Muskegon Chronicle for years, and then after the Muskegon Chronicle chapter, he retired, and then he traveled extensively. And so, uh, you know, there'd be always be postcards at the house from Lex going somewhere, going somewhere on a cruise ship somewhere, some wonderful old photographs and things like that. And then the thing that sort of catches everyone's eye here is the shrunken head, and uh, which comes from, I think, up on the Amazon. And, um, there's a, a whole story here about Lex and, and uh, his collection, and um, just very extensive travels and uh, curious, curious person, interesting guy. He also wrote a lot about Sidoni. Monkey skin heads was obtained in the home of Chief so-and-so of the head shrinking something tribe of the Peruvian Amazon Indians. I mean, all... all Just great, great, fascinating things. Yeah, this gets into the uh, the Ferry family, and the Ferry family were basically uh, they founded Grand Haven. Uh, he was a minister, Mackinac Island, came down here, founded Grand Haven, Ferrysburg, Ferrysville, down at the Old Channel Inn, that mouth area. And then um, Noah Ferry went off with a, 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 some of the troops from uh, the what called the White River Brigade. They went off to Gettysburg. And then unfortunately on July 3rd, 1864, Noah Ferry was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg. But the person who also was involved with um, 
with uh, Gettysburg and, and sort of painting the Civil War was Frederick Norman from Whitehall. And uh, the Norman paintings are on the White, uh, Whitehall bank over there. Uh, um, and then we have um, the Reverend William Montague, and that's where Montague gets its name. He married Amanda White Ferry. She had a sister named Mary, the elementary school in Grand Havens called Mary White. Uh, a whole display on the Ferry family here. Founded Ferry Memorial Church, the parsonage. Uh, they had the mill, um, very prominent family in Western Michigan. These come from the Catholic Church out in Point Banks, I think. Okay, different stations of the cross. Cross and the, No, it's a mixture of a lot of churches. The history of Jack Bercy and exploring the Arctic and the Antarctic, I think. Yes, he went with Admiral Byrd several times to the Antarctic. And the reason he went, he was the dog sled man from uh, Newfoundland. And uh, that's why he got to go with Admiral Byrd. And he worked here on the staff. Well, okay. Very nice guy. Here's some of his books. Those are shoes they wore. They didn't have the old felt like we had. Wow. They used a grass from Newfoundland to wrap their feet in, dried grass, wrap their feet in them. And that was their insulation. And him and his wife had the acres of diamond store down here on Old Channel Trail. This this was my grandparents' the parlor set up this. Oh. <laughs> And uh, as a family, the older ones died off, I collected in Florida, I had them reupholstered. Okay. Yeah, wonderful collection of ammonites and stones and things like that. And then also up here, a couple of the World's Fair, the Century of Progress in uh, Chicago, along the waterfront. 1934. Bigman was a Columbian Exposition, 1893. So, okay, gold races, 1925, gold cup races. Al Pack, Clarence Pitkin, uh, grandstands were built for this race. Thousands were spent on seating. Uh, somehow, this is the hall, the, the grandstand is here. This is like what we used to call the coal dock, Bardo's Marina there, and then the city of Montague's up here, and then this is taken from the tannery. And so you can see people congregating here, obviously not in the stands, but waiting for the races to begin. And so there's all sorts of information on um, the Gold Cup races of 1925. Historical Society had a meeting down there years ago, um, but um, those were the grandstands that they built. They were having Detroit races. They, they would have uh, motor races in the Detroit River, and so um, Historical Society basically featured Celebrate White Lake, uh, and that portion we did the White Lake Gold Cup races. Uh, we did that in 2001. Just more information about the White Lake Gold Cup races, okay? 1925, uh, you've got the Wabanigo Club down at Sylvan. Uh, the power boats, they were racing the power boats on the Detroit River. And so Continental Motors was making motors and so they did these very sleek boats. Bardo Boat Works made some down there at, at, uh, in Maple Grove. And uh, here they are, you can kind of see them racing. And this is another spot, but uh, uh, they, went, they went wildly down the lake. These are a series of canes that were collected by Marjorie DeWitt, uh, Marjorie Dowling DeWitt. She was the kindergarten teacher that uh, everyone had, and there's always lots of stories, and so these canes are all, this is to certify that Marjorie DeWitt has been at the Rainbow Bridge on something night, uh, 1951, uh, and they're, they're all inscribed, and uh, 
This one says Lake O'Hara, Alberta, Kansas. Beck, what's the one you say? It says something like uh, Trail Ridge Road, Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, she traveled extensively always. And uh, here's another one that says, um, this is to certify Marjorie DeWitt has hiked 10 days in Glacier National Park, August 3, 1953. Um, some more names, and then uh, I guess the people who hiked with her, uh, but all obviously all kind of her hiking sticks. Um, we'll go downstairs later on, and then she has a uh, birch bark canoe, which is down there in the Marjorie DeWitt room, which also is a great story. In her dip in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, you did some great walking sticks. Yeah, but she just picked these up evidently wherever she was, but she brought them home with her. Right. And 53, I think that's after we were out of school. We were out of school, right. But she's retired then, right? I thought she was a great, people always had stories about her, but I thought she was great. She taught kids discipline. And Grace, and they had that little fish pond down there. Right. She'd come down with the kids, and each kid stood in line and went up and looked, and then they got to the back of the line, you know. Well, that's what I can say. She, she was a great environmentalist. She well, taught those kids all about that. These are some photos of Al Pack, and Al Pack basically was a, a big yachtsman, had some foundries, steel mills, and uh, it's now what's called Oxy Lodge. And so there's uh, Mr. and Mrs. Pack and um, down at the old house down by Whitbrook Road. This is the original uh, Bardo Boatworks in the background there. It lasted a long, long time. Uh, came down when uh, ultimately 1920s lasted until probably the 1970s. And so this is called Miss White Lake, owned by Commodore Albert Pack, which will contend for the free-for-all runabout championship. Um, but anyway, those boats were made down at Bardo Boatworks and uh, that's one of them, the speedboats for a Gold Cup race, it's 1925. Yeah. If you come and you do a shift, you're supposed to do a shift for help the Montague Museum as a docent, and you do a shift from one to five on Saturday or Sunday. And so if it's slow, what you end up doing is you open up something, and then you start exploring on your own, and there's just endless, this says postcards, postcards, uh, lots of information you just get into, it's fascinating. This is another painting by Frederick Norman, and it's the um, White Lake Channel. These other paintings are in the Whitehall Bank. Is this a kid's teeter tot? <laughs> Fun. Of course, Lawrence Electric, and it had electric, electric lights and stuff. Oh, okay. And there must be an on button or something, which it's wound up. Or oh, maybe that's a switch right there. It's leather. Like a homemade thing. Yeah. yeah. It says Columbia. Please do not touch. Okay. God, that looks like something that came from Sydney or something. No, no, yeah, some guy in Whitehall built that. I can't remember. What it was. Wow. It does look like stuff at Sedonia. Sedonia is right. Yeah. Well, or Howard Durham. KSTC of Hayes. First prize, Artistic Float, July 4th, 1924, Ellis County.
I, that is a picture, I think, of Frederick Norman. His palette. Yeah. That cow, that was a few cow shots. Yeah. Little Point Sable. The top one was made by uh, Nels Olson. He was the one that. Trinity Lutheran Church on uh, Stony Lake Road. And that came back to us by his son. That came into, uh, from Sun City, Arizona, it came into Pitkins on the Greyhound. And I went and hauled it here. Really? And it was laid down. Jack Bercy put all the rigging back up and stuff okay. on it. Would that not have been a lumbering schooner? Yeah, well, I don't know. He, he carved it, just put his own name on it. Huh. Winslow, Seth Winslow. they had the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. It was the Great World's Fair, and it was the Great White City. And basically, it, it was all Beaux-Arts architecture, Juan Lagoons, Frederick Law Olmsted, Daniel Burnham, the whole city planning gang. It was a great boom to Chicago. And like everyone somehow from here went down on the boats, and they would go down on the boats, and basically it was all like white columns in the Great White City. And so like if you drive on Old Channel Trail, you'll see like every house has a white porch Kind of yeah, these counters were all donated by Glenn Lipton and from the old Ripley drugstore. These are the ones we pushed down the street on the ice. <laughs> well, this was the, there's a little electric heater and you heat it up lead and poured it in molds. And... Here's the early train, all right? And then right alongside of it is the another generation of the rocket. Yeah, you, you put some camps in here and then you take it and you bang. Okay, and this came from? Well, the one switchboard's from the Occidental Hotel and the other one's from DuPont. Really? And the rest of the phones are all just gathered all over. Yeah, when you call them. To the uh, operator over there in Whitehall, where Falby's Hair Place is. Right. That's the old phone company for the area. You rung up the operator, and she talked to you, and found out who you wanted to talk to, and plugged you into them. And maybe they got four rings and two longs and two shorts or something. And, and then everybody on the party line picked up to see who, who was talking. Right, who's talking <laughs> where? Right, right, right. Yeah, being a switchboard operator was a big deal. Remember Edie Nesbitt was. Yeah, her and her sister <laughs> Pearl. And, uh, right. And uh, one of the hall girls. Uh, okay. And they probably knew everything going on in town, right? Well, they had to. Well, you know, it's amazing, like with the ones downstairs, the kids don't know how to work a dial. Oh, they don't. I know, right, right, right. I mean, they'll go like they want to, they'll punch it. this thing that they can. <laughs> it's true. I can remember our first one at home, we had a box like that. And, a phone like this. You cranked up. Right. 
But that's a happy looking couple there. Look yeah, at so that. Yeah. <laughs> happy to be here. <laughs> we hope you are too. <laughs> Smile, baby. Is that mom and pop bell? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, just Rochefield at Browns Pond out on Fruitvale Road, uh, big deal. Uh, up until probably about the 50s when it finally all burned down. But uh, you know, people come up on the Goodrich boats and then they take a launch up the river or, or go out by road. And then, uh, interesting spot, Chad. Yeah, it was, uh, well, it started out with Browns. The pond was built for the uh, this water mill there one of the five water mills in the area. And then it reverted in it. And they'd sold lots. Oh yeah. All over in Chicago. They'd give one away and then you had to buy another one in order to build a house on it. And then Bill Hansen has done, you know, The Lost City of Fruitvale. Done a couple books on that. And uh, very interesting, as Jack mentioned, like 25 by 100 foot lots. I mean, dinky, dinky lots. And, um, I always remember, like, Dad was a surveyor and so said, hey, I bought, you know, I got lot one or four or five or something in block six, and, you know, what street is it on? And it's in the middle of the woods. It's all yeah, paper, paper streets. So it was never planted. Uncle Bill was working for Kings at one time, and they people come in and go look at their lots. They always showed them the same property <laughs> over and over and over. Because, yeah, they, you didn't know where your stuff was. That's the Goodrich steamship coming in, and that's down at the that's down at Maple Grove. That's the old dock there down at the Narrows, the tanneries right over there. And so, obviously, they would come here, and then you can see there's a launch ready to take them up to Rochdale, or you go up by bus. Kennedy, the torch has passed. And so just different books on, on history, Michigan history, that sort of thing. This is your first height of that. Well, okay. And it just flipped on out. Just, when there wasn't a lot of extra bedrooms, you had this fire there. It looked like a fireplace, but it was really an extra bed. We talked about Dowie and the other room. 1893 World's Fair, Columbian Expedition, Chicago. Incredible fair. Actually, these are a bunch of plates and things from that. This was all kind of a Rochdale Inn. Harold Kasner has done a lot of work on this. Uh, Brown's Pond starts out as a lumbering site up above here and then um, grows into uh, this, this summer resort uh, called Rochdale Inn. There's sort of the beautiful people on the limb here. And then the banjo girls. And he would take people up there. Okay, that's Frank Ramsey Adams, Newfer Adams Playhouse, 1916, and the 100-year centennial is now. And so obviously, then here, here are a bunch of old scripts and things like that, that are Frank Adams' writings. He wrote for Cosmopolitan, Red Book, a lot of great script writer uh, out in L.A., uh, interesting story in, in, in California world. Marion Davies, San Simeon, that sort of thing, and William Randolph Hearst. Here we are, 1924. If we look in here, there'll be an article by Frank Ramsey Adams. Oh, there it is, okay. Been heartbroken at 17. Boy, part one, the kiss. Part two. Well, this is just the, the files of uh, a lot of stuff that the people want to look up stuff. And we got stuff for sale here. Um, so if you wanted something on the Ferry family, you wanted something on Dowling, etc., you just kind of go to the file and, uh, I mean, I look at this, there's something obviously that's, <laughs> that's Nellie B. Chisholm kind of thing, right? Um, 
County Commissioner of Schools. And so obviously there's a file on Chisholm there. And uh, Duck and Gresham Pat Brocky did a lot of filing a long time ago. It desperately needs more filing. Yeah, yeah when I have duty here, people love this because oh, I mean, yeah. they come in here and, and they'll spend they'll spend the whole afternoon just, just going through going through these wonderful photographs. And there's a story behind every one. Actually, Jim Haley's picked up. There's some wonderful photographs of uh, Old Town, Montague, Whitehall, Goodrich Park, G and Carr, Hardware Store, Bell's Furniture. Uh, just lots of information, uh, Montague, pictorial history. Harold Kasner does good stuff. What's very, very simple. Obviously, there's, there's a new book on the White Lake Golf Club, and they're having their 100th. Dan Yates' book, Land Between Silk Beach. Um, a lot of good stuff. Bud and Aileen Fritch died. And um, Bud just died recently, but they restored some wonderful houses. And um, the last house they did is the one up there. That's the old, that, was, that house was built by the Knudsen family, the Knudsen family, uh, one of the signers of the original plat of the city of Montague. Fairy Memorial Church had it. A lot of things on Sedoni. The staircase and uh, collectibles of some Charlie Eilers. He was a captain on one of the boats. He traveled the world. Huh. Got a lot of this. One of the Eilers from out here in the country. Well, Nancy Fleming, uh, Miss America in 1961, and uh, first was Miss Michigan, and then uh, from Montague, and then uh, went to Michigan State, and then went on and went to a Los Angeles chapter, married Jim Lang, dating game, um, and um, Nancy lives in Mill Valley, where I used to live. I called her last winter, as a matter of fact. Wonderful, wonderful lady. This is all school collections of annuals, different books on different schools, the country schools, stuff. It's trying to get all the uh, annuals. The yearbooks, right? Yearbooks, yeah. What happens in the school is that they were like little district schools, you know, township schools, and then slowly they consolidated them. They consolidated them, and, and, and Nellie B. Chisholm was very involved in that and consolidated the, the Montague High School, uh, the old early building. And uh, anyway, so then the schools basically became part of the consolidated school system, and they did a lot of busing and things like that. Montague Schools was probably the first to have portable classrooms. They moved two of the country schools, the G and the Sumner School, in here on William Street and fixed them up for extra classrooms back in the late 40s. After World War II, there was like, you know, the population boom, young, young people and also the, the DuPont people and the chemical people. And, and, um, and so you needed brooms and so they, they moved them in town. Dowie Point, John Alexander Dowie, the late 1890s, 1906, and um, great shot up there. We kind of looked like the Pope. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh to Australia, Australia back to Edinburgh University, University, then back to back to Australia, and then comes through San Francisco, preaches. Uh, and then ends up in 1893 in the World's Fair in Chicago. It has a little tabernacle. And, uh, and then he's a faith healer. You know, heal this person. And somehow they are healed. And so we had a great following. He ends up buying 6,000 acres north of Chicago. And, you know, follow me, I'll take you to Zion. And he built Zion, Illinois. And uh, that was his summer house down at Dowie Point. Hmm. Now Oxysite. Great collection on Dowie. Colorful character. He said his office in, in Chicago there was uh, he had crutches and, and all that stuff hanging on the wall where people came in with them. 
left walking on. on I'm cured. I'm cured. Yeah. yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then he had a daughter. There's a, <clears throat> obviously that's probably Esther. He preached against alcohol, and you were not supposed to be involved with alcohol. <clears throat> and somehow she was using an alcohol curling lamp, curling iron kind of thing, and it exploded, and, and she had severe burns. And then um, she died, and it was very awkward because basically he's the faith healer, and he can't heal his daughter. He got very grand. It started out being very simple, then ends up being very grand. <laughs> this here corner collection is from Mrs. Gibbs, our old music teacher oh, yeah. at this school. Or hers, bands. Obviously, this is, has to do with kind of like style. You so, know, there, yeah. there, there's what people wore. I mean, um, interesting. Also, what's interesting, I, mean, just, I just saw this, Carmelita Guerin, she was a very colorful lady, Silver Beach, had a shop called the Valhalla, down at Silver Beach, worked for the Chamber of Commerce here. Uh, Guerin family was very big, they started with one of the members of the sailing school, yacht club kind of thing. Had a house struck by lightning down the dunes. My grandpa got that from Carl's Tavern for being a good customer. <laughs> really? It was filled with whiskey. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. Refillable, right? Probably, yeah. Well, Doc Smith was one of our old dentists here. He's graduated at the University of Michigan. He was uh, quite a community man. He was on the council and stuff. And, but his stuff was rather crude in those days. I mean, the, the way they worked on your teeth wasn't what we have today. That was horrible. <laughs> I mean, I think I went to him once kind of thing. And it was like, you know, the drilling was like a, a rubber band or something that went around and yeah. on and on and on and made a horrible grinding sound. And, it was upstairs over Lipkin's store, and so you had to climb up a thousand steps. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I suppose today they wouldn't let Jeff because that lead pine or something like that. But anyway, amazing. You climbed all the steps, and then, but actually, Jack is right. He was very much involved, and he was one of the first mayors of Montague, and then renovated a house behind our house, and then built a house down in Maple Grove. Um, interesting guy. I like to say, you know, we had Doc Goss and Doc Willett. Right. They didn't have any equipment. They looked at your nails and your eyes and they took your blood pressure and stuff and guessed, I guess, what was wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they were they did all right for the people. This is the hair pressure up there. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. Oh, hair. Oh, my. That's scary. What was Louisa? Remember she was? No. Uh, yeah, they just uh, put all those clips on and then turn the electricity on and they heated them up, <laughs> heated them up and curled your hair. You now, we have, something. now we have electric curlers, or then they use this style and uh, heated it on the stove or the old lamp. Right, that's what Dowie's daughter would have been using. Using, right? yeah. yeah. They used to do it in a lamp or on the stove. <laughs> These are the bars from the old mining jail. Okay, get me out of here. Hurry, hurry. Yes. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wasn't drinking. <laughs> right, 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 right. That wasn't right. me. <laughs> Tell that to the cops. And that's about all they had in the old jail, I think, was a drunk once in a while. Fire department was started in the uh, 1860s or 70s by the lumber people 
for a little protection for their buildings. And it's grown into quite a setup. Okay? This old host cart was right here at the top of the hill. And the, the water mains on Sheridan and Mead were fire lines. They'd pump it up with the old steam engine down at the city hall out of the creek. Really? Pressurize the mains. That's they pull this here. That was Earl Shortham, the old alphabet, the old farmer out here in the country, and then he lived down here on White Lake later years. That's great. All from pine roots. This is a bean sort, these two are bean sorters. Yeah, that was Lutz. There's the sorry, yeah. one of them right behind here. Down below. That was Rufus Hunt had that. Then he sold it to Grovers and they cut it and ice and put it up for the But ice was a big business. Mm -hmm. and there was people that contracted because all the resorts and stuff around the lake had ice houses. So they'd contract with people to fill their houses every winter. And so there was a lot of people made, you know, living off of it in the wintertime. This is one of the first washing machines. You just put it in a bucket. Worked it up and down like that. This is the kind of stuff that when kids come by today, they look at it and they can't quite believe the idea that, you know, yeah. like, you can't put it in the you know, you can't put it in the dryer, you have to put it in crank it. I mean, come on, you know. You don't mean to scrub it. It's real, you know. I don't know how that was supposed to work this one. We just rock back and forth in this one. A gentle wash. Beach going down to the creek, right? Yeah, yeah. The old shoe, everybody fixed their own shoes and stuff, and you had them redone. Now we just sew them in the garbage. But, um, right. Old Axel Jonas, the old Johnson, an old harness man in town, he went eventually re revolved into fixing shoes and stuff. This is for like horses to keep horses flies, flies off, right? off, yeah. Well, with teams, oh, that's for a three-horse hookup. You had it, horse, horse, horse. Three horsepower. Three horsepower. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the old cracks for making sour trout. Okay. There's the evolution of vacuum cleaners over there, also. Get a Hoover. So this is where so much of mesquite comes in. It starts out, you know, you start making something, and then you improve it, and you improve it, and it gets bigger and bigger, and, um, and industry goes on, and now it seems like it's all miniaturized and uh, electronic, whereas before, uh, manufacturing amazing stuff. Look at these gadgets. I have no idea what this is. That's for uh, boring and barn beans. Okay, big, big, yeah. You yeah. clamp this on the beam. Okay. You'd set it up or straight up or whatever angle. And then you'd sit there and there's two handles. You'd clamp. This is a little more modern one. Okay. But that's how they board for the pigs and bean barns. Yeah, just fascinating equipment. That's a hay fork. Oh, okay, hay fork. 
in the barn and dropped down and the white load went up and crossed and dropped right, it again. Right, right, right. A gas heater for cars, and they, they use a lot of them in the ward for in planes and stuff, but it run off gasoline, and you pull this out and it started. You had that in the compartment with you. You went from the old manifold heaters and the, to this style, and here's an old drill. Of course, these were just about everybody in the country had a sharpening stone. Um, but they made thousands of them over at uh, Grand Stone City up in the Thelma, and the Michigan, right at the top of the Thelma. This is the cup, grain and wheat. Some of them had a cradle on the back of it, so you'd cut your wheat like that and then dump it. Then the wife and kids come along, take some of the straw and put it in a bundle. Uh, but it's still, that came out of the, the depot down here, not here. That's a coffee grinder, would, be, would have been in a store. Put your uh, coffee beans in there. Where'd the batteries go? <laughs> <laughs> right here. Yeah, right, right. That, those are all green machines. This here little stove. Wood to coal fire. They made those down here in the foundry. Cast these tops and this door. Put the rods in. Down, D. Webster had a lot to do with that. They were manufactured for and sold to Coca-Cola Company for in their trucks. Imagine going down the road with a wood fire in your back here. <laughs> but that's what they were for. But most of the people in the town had one for their fish shanties. Right. So there's a couple of them. Here. But that's, they cast them down here in the foundry and uh, put them together at Webster's store, which would have been uh, Myers. Yeah. 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 They were from the guest hall and Krupp uh, barbershop. Ah. Rather elaborate. Yeah. How about the back bar, Jack? That came from there, too. Uh, for a cistern. You know, where you had water in the cistern. You just go out and get your wash water. And stuff. Oh, okay. Really? Soft water. Once again, was hand powered. That's why people had a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. But those cups would go down and bring the water up and dump it. There's a spout on the other end. Place, yeah. That was you 
begin to get where you can keep stuff. The next step you had one you could keep ice cream in and stuff. This comes from over at Lysman. Oh really? Okay. They, they got a new one, the dad got with them. And Mrs. Voss up on the North Hill, just across on Park Street. She was an old lady and dad had got her house under uh, she had life lease to anyway, got that, put it, took it to her. Uh -huh. When we were remodeling the house after she died, it went up to Osborne's cabin up in the UP. Well it, traveled. You could just go up there and you plug the thing in and chuck a little bit and the way it went, unplugged it, and it was still running the day they unplugged it and brought it in. Well this room was a storeroom and a workshop and and with Henry Rossler and we got together and we just I patched the ceiling and Charlie Hoagland came and we painted it and uh, painted the room and put the light these lights up and and then the gals turned the gals loose and they went around the museum because this all this kitchen stuff was everywhere and they gathered everything and brought it in and made the display. Irons. In the early days these old Irons would sit on the stove and you just change the piece here. I always had a hot one. Then you went to, this is an alcohol burner to eat it. Then your electric ones came along. This was a heater. If you didn't have your range running, you could heat your uh, kerosene burner here. Toasters. This here's an early toaster. You just brought this out and turned the other side of the bread and put it back. <laughs> and then, of course, we got to the pop ups. Early waffle irons. That's all meat saw from the store. Early day cream separators. People with the you know ten, twelve cows, they'd separate the cream off, sell the cream, the skim milk which we drink now, went to the hogs. That's an early churn. Cream churn. During the era of wood ranges in the kitchen, in the summertime they got pretty hot, so people went to these kerosene stoves. Kerosene was in the bottle over here. And outside of stinking, they were worked <laughs> pretty good. Make your own malted milks. Different meat grinders. Sausage makers put the stuff in there and grind it into a tube out here. Another old butter churn. That's a coffee grinder. This here is a, a cutting cold saw cabbage. Put it in here. Well, I guess it's locked in. Push that back and forth and slice your cabbage. People still do that at home now. Mm -hmm. This bottle is from the Montague Brewing Company. Okay. Which was right where John Elke's house is now on the hill oh. on Ferry Street, up above the wayside. They had good spring water coming through there. And that was for the the brewer. Because that went like that that I found it down at Maple Grove Park. I'll be seeing the old landfill kind yeah. of stuff. And then all the cherry pitters and things up there. Yeah. I mean women canned all their stuff. Women the woman's life wasn't easy. Right. 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 I mean she canned, had all the peaches, pears, everything done, canned meat and stuff in the basement. They didn't run to the store every day or two. No. 
Let's put a microwave it. Yeah. I don't know. It looks pretty. That's yeah, a wood shovel. Yeah. Well made. Okay, the Franklin House down at the corner of Ferry Street and Dowling. Uh, the big great porch in front um, continued. Uh, the Montague Bank was here. This is the Dowling Street Hill. Down here in 1961, the fire, the great fire burns. Um, trails meet, went from Murray's End over to Lau Road. Uh, you put your car on there and you could go back and forth without having to drive around the lake. Um, Sherman's Ark, which is here, uh, down which is off at Lakeside Inn, and uh, used it for winter fishing and they rented a little, you can see all the little rental uh, cabins out there, fish shanties. Um, Yacht Club, gaff rigs, uh, slide, toboggan slide, kind of, you know, kind of like water wonderland kind of thing, and that would be down at uh, White Lake Villa, Swenson's. Um, and then a wonderful shot down there, the Alpac Boathouse and one of his big yachts. Oh, that is pretty. Yeah, we talked earlier about Marjorie DeWitt and that, um, Basically, she had this little birch bark canoe and she would paddle it around. And uh, actually, I found a piece of birch bark, and I thought kids don't even know what birch bark is, but basically, Marjorie Dowling DeWitt's birch bark canoe is made out of basically Betula, that's a genus species name, um, habitat for the tree. But there's birch, and then that's made out of birch put on the frame. And um, she had that at the old DeWitt house. painted the murals on the wall here, Jack? Oh, Everett G. I kind of wondered. He looks like Everett G. Yeah, it does. This was manufactured in my initiative. Which was? This little carving set. And it says that. Okay. It's magic. Yes. Did they retire to the biggest house on the highest hill? See carved animals with that. All right. Another another clue on on the. Uh, propeller here is that, uh, as has been pointed out here, the propeller was cast by the Wilton Henry Foundry in Montague Iron Works, 1880s, and then it was taken from a tugboat, the William Richards, after sinking in White Lake. And uh, I don't know where in White Lake it, it sank. It was sunk right in uh, down in the slip. slip. 
about where the Ellenwood uh, clubhouse is okay. now. Okay. 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 Yeah, and here it is. All donations accepted. Okay, we started here at the Monaghy Museum and we went in the side entrance, here the front entrance, and now we are concluding. And so we're standing here leaning against this wonderful propeller, which was made by the Montague Iron Work, which is located now where Montague Foods is located now. And uh, Jack's told some very interesting stories about the early days of the museum. Also, Jim is very knowledgeable about the current and evolving Montague Museum. And so uh, we hope that everyone will come and visit the Montague Museum. And also, the Montague Museum also is always looking for help donations and also a lot of help during the summer season. You take a shift from one to five and the museum is yours for your shift and uh, you learn a lot and discover a lot. Thanks for coming.